The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When it was evening of the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord Jesus, said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. All of the doors were shut. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Come, Lord Jesus, and set our hearts on fire with your love. Amen. Amen. Well, happy Easter. happy Easter. Thank you. Yes, here we are on Easter Day. We have a glorious celebration of the resurrection. And now as we enter into the Easter season, we are left with an awkward question. So what? What difference does the resurrection actually make in our lives? Now the disciples were puzzling over that question too, and so it's instructive to look at the post-resurrection accounts, and we see a theme that emerges again and again, and that is a series of personal encounters with the risen Jesus, which leads to profound spiritual transformation. Now, our society today desperately needs spiritual transformation, especially our young people. When I was in seminary, I did a deep dive into spiritual transformation in young adult men because I was curious, why is it that young adult men, or young men generally, is the toughest demographic for the church to reach? And I quickly saw that by almost any measure, Young men in America today are in crisis. Now, many of the issues that affect boys and young men are generational. For all genders, establishing an integrated self has become even more fraught than for previous generations, 
due to the society in which we live. Many young people are searching with no real sense of purpose, meaning, direction. A psychologist told me recently he specializes in young adults and he finds a profound loneliness coupled with an absence of vision, of not even knowing what questions to ask. So their crisis is not just a crisis of uh, belonging, but not feeling that the world has a place for them to belong. So for self-identified males, the search for a coherent identity is particularly acute because the notion of masculine identity is contested in a way that feminine identity is not. As young men try to figure out what healthy modern masculinity looks like, many find few or no healthy adult male role models. Up to 40% of boys do not have a father in the home, and there is simply a dearth of responsible, generative men who are willing to be present to boys and young, younger men. And so that leaves a lot of guys trying to emulate the perfect bodies and hedonistic lifestyles of celebrities and sports stars. And quite frankly, many boys are simply adrift. They become susceptible to alternate realities and online arousal addiction, be that kill cycles on video games or the ubiquitous pornography, both of which erode the willingness and even the ability to engage in real world, ch world challenges and relationships. For example, at the close of the academic year 2021, uh, only 40% of students were male and nearly 60% were female or other genders. And yet college educated women want to marry college educated men. And perhaps that explains in part why more U.S. men ages 18 to 34 are now living with their parents than with a romantic partner. So what do we do as a church? What do we do as Holy Comforter? And I think first we have to confront the awful paradox. And that is, that which young people are desperately seeking is that which the church believes it is supremely able to offer. And yet young people are streaming out of the churches, men even faster than women. They simply do not believe that they will find meaning, belonging, and authentic spiritual connection in churches. So if we as a parish, if we as a church want to support young men on their journeys to healthy manhood, we have to recognize them as inherently spiritual beings with particular needs and ways of learning. And we must raise up trustworthy men who are willing to be present for boys and young men. How do we empower and accompany the boys and young men in our community to grow into their masculine fullness? How do we help them navigate the crucial transitions of the teen years? These are the tough but vital questions we will explore on the men's retreat in May. We will also brainstorm ways in which to build on the excellent work of the youth group, the acolytes, the choir, and all the adults who offer themselves as mentors, teachers, and trainers in this parish. I believe that we men and Holy Comforter also have an opportunity to open our arms to boys and young men outside of Holy Comforter. It's an investment in all our futures and perhaps an incredible opportunity for us to grow as a parish. But we have a bigger and more complex challenge. We need to articulate a positive Christ-centered theology of masculinity that speaks to men even while also recognizing that male power has traditionally been abused. Traditional the theology was largely written by men with a strong male bias, and that has rightly been challenged. Female theologians have expanded our understanding by using the divine feminine as a lens to see anew our Judeo-Christian heritage, and that is all very much to be welcomed. 
The misuse of male power over the generations has produced this necessary correction in our thinking. Course corrections may sometimes overcorrect, however. And in focusing almost exclusively on the abuses of male power, we have neglected to identify the positive aspects of masculinity and maleness. So when the dominant narrative revolves only around toxic masculinity, patriarchy, male privilege, and abuse of male power, it can seem that masculinity is something to recover from rather than to live into. The constant emphasis on the negatives leave many boys and young men, and indeed men in general, feeling shame simply for being born male. And yet a theology rooted in shame is hugely counterproductive. Why? Because shame is already the core wound of most men. Guilt is when we have done something wrong. Shame comes from feeling we have not lived up to our own norms of what it means to be a man. Many men have lost a sense of greater purpose, particularly as traditional roles of men as protector, provider, and warrior have shifted. Shame is the root cause of skyrocketing rates of addiction and suicide among men, and shame is at the core of much male dysfunction. In other words, we all get wounded by life, but we can be very resilient, or at least we can recognize when our wounds are triggering us into behaviors that we don't want. Shame is like an infection in a physical wound. Shame prevents the wound from healing, and it makes it ugly, and so we want to cover it up rather than naming it and exposing it to the light. Some of us compensate for our shame in one arena by overperforming in others. So even successful men may carry throbbing pain hidden behind facades of competence or aggressive competitiveness. Others numb themselves through all manner of addictions. Others keep seeking to demonstrate their masculinity through adolescent behaviors, even well into adulthood. Shaming men for being men is like rubbing dirt into an open wound. It will only make it more toxic. Well, why should we care if men feel ashamed? Don't they have it coming? As Father Richard Rohr repeatedly says, pain that is not transformed will be transmitted. Much of the pain men feel was transmitted to them. And if their pain is not transformed, we all suffer. So how do we break this cycle? What is the antidote to shame? Psychologist Wade and Izako write, grace works to remove the experience of rejection that lies at the heart of shame. Connectedness, identity, and acceptance are at the core of what is needed to transform shame. Does that sound familiar? Jesus knew that. Throughout the gospel, we see Jesus reaching out to women and men who are under terrible burdens of shame and exclusion. Mary Magdalene and the woman with the issue of blood come to mind immediately. And in today's gospel, Jesus invited Thomas to touch his still raw wounds. Now Thomas had seen Jesus raise Lazarus, and yet he insisted on physical proof that Jesus had really risen. And so Jesus chides him for that. But he doesn't shame him. He doesn't cancel him. And Thomas goes on to do great things in the new church. And then there's Zacchaeus. When Jesus was entering a town, he saw the richest man for miles around up a sycamore tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. I'm coming to dine with you today. So why would Jesus have dinner with the most hated man in the region, the chief tax collector? Because by extending acceptance, connection, and grace, Jesus brought to fruition a magnificent transformation that was occurring in Zacchaeus. Through his encounter with Jesus, Zacchaeus embraced his path to redemption. 
And this is why I personally am devoting so much of my time to Illumin. Illumin is a spiritually grounded movement for men fathered by, uh, founded by Father Richard Rohr. In Illumin, I see hurting men find accountability, acceptance, connection, and liberation from their shame. We are men transforming men through a power greater than ourselves. That's the motto that Richard Rohr gave us as our mission. Liberating men from their pain and shame is holy work because their transformation opens them to the sacred masculine that blesses those around them. They can stop transmitting their pain and instead let it be transformed into positive energy. As generative men, they can encourage and empower women and girls to unfold their gifts. They can offer themselves as mentors to young men. And what of us as the Episcopal Church? When men come into our churches, do they find exception, acceptance and connection and grace? Or do they find only more shame? Christian churches urgently need to offer a vision of healthy, Christ-centered masculinity that is anchored in the unshakable love of God. Young men need to know and to experience in our community that they are first and foremost and eternally beloved sons of God. Where, whatever they are going through, that God is there with them. Perhaps our message to young men would go something like this. You are beloved sons of God. You are beloved sons of God. You are beloved sons of God. You are not an accident. You are not random. And you are not alone. You were created by a loving God who gave you a unique and precious identity. He has purposes for you, purposes that will take you beyond yourself to serve something and someone greater than you. It's true that God has also given you the freedom to choose your own identity and your own purposes. But the truest and most noble version of yourself is hidden by God in Christ Jesus. You do not create this best and truest self, whether you discover it and live into it day by day. And here's what's so wonderful. Because this true self already exists, you don't, it's not dependent on likes. Yes, you have to navigate your image among your peers, but your Instagram self is only an experiment, a curated identity, a temporary interface. Social media is way too fickle to create a coherent and lasting identity that will get you through the stress and the turmoil of life. So hold that transient Snapchat version of yourself very lightly while you put your real energy into discovering this true self. This true self is the man God created you to be at the beginning of time. And he has held you in his heart through the millennia, waiting to launch you into this moment of history. He has purposes for you that only you can accomplish. But where do you find this truest and most noble self? And how do you know your purposes? Well, here's a paradox. Only you can discover that identity, but you cannot do it alone. First, you need to encounter Jesus, for in finding Jesus, you will realize more and more the man God created you to be. This is at the heart of the Easter Gospel. Thomas and the disciples only fully knew who they were when they met the risen Jesus. And second, Though you must find your own way, you need the company of other seekers. Like Frodo Baggins or Harry Potter or the Apostle Paul, your hero's journey will fail if you try to do it alone. You need companions on the journey and you need a community. You are already blessed, perhaps more than you realize, to be in this community of Holy Comforter. 
a community of flawed and imperfect people of all ages and genders. We are people seeking to become the persons God created us to be through encounters with the risen Christ. We cannot spare you the pains of this life, nor the consequences of your own mistakes, but we can accompany you and encourage you on this part of your journey. You can belong here. You can be accepted here as a fellow seeker with all your gifts and with all your flaws and failures and mistakes. Now, I believe God is doing a new thing in you and your generation. Your generation of men will redefine what it means to be a man. This is a huge undertaking with few precedents. And there's a noisy cacophony of contradictory voices trying to tell you what this new masculinity should look like. The older men in your lives can assist you by sharing honestly their own experiences. Caring women can share the divine feminine with you. But only you and your peers can live into that fresh version of what it means to be a man in this season of our history. It's a tough time to be a man, so be patient with yourselves. You will fail often, and you will often not live into that truest and best version of yourself. So just strive to be the man God created you to be on this day. I cannot know the purposes that God has for you, but I do know this. Whatever your mission is, no matter how impossible it seems, you never have to do it alone. The mission Jesus gave his friends seemed wildly impossible, but the Holy Spirit of Jesus came upon them at Pentecost and fill them with supernatural power. And we see in today's lesson in Acts that that made them fearless. They could face threats and violence because they knew deep in their bones that God's love for them was unshakable. And then they went and changed the world. So go encounter Jesus and ask him to fill you with his supernatural power. And then boldly go where no generation has gone before to accomplish the great and noble deeds that God has saved for you. Make it so. Amen. Amen. Amen.